Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, and I, I'm just going to be honest and say, I'm in a state of terror. I've done this so many times, not this talk, but I don't know, there's something about your best audience. Um, I mean, I, I wrote this for you at Ohio Dominican because it's about the, the common good. And so I felt a weight of responsibility that I sometimes don't feel when I go out and give papers at other places, you know what I mean? So anyway, thank you for making me bring what I hope will be my A game. Um, and I hope you are emotionally moved, inspired, bothered, and delighted by the things that you'll see today, because we'll see a lot of different sorts of art, okay? And um, Father Michael really um, hit a couple of things that I was going to, to talk about in the beginning, but I want to just one more time orient this idea of art that addresses the common good. When we are educated in schools, art is usually about beauty first, right? That's the, what do you call it, the hook. And I'll show you some of that today at the very end of this, uh, of this talk. But um, perhaps the most important work is the work that speaks the truth that can't be written, that speaks for those who can't. And a lot of the works that I'm going to be showing you today are just those sorts of works. I will warn you and say that there's one very disturbing image. It's a photograph. And um, I felt it was really important to include it. Um, so I'll give you a little heads up, but I really couldn't imagine talking about the work that I'm going to work without this one photograph. Okay? Thank you. Um, uh, I want to begin by quoting Pope Francis from 2015 in Laudito Si. In the present condition of global society, where injustices abound and growing numbers of people are deprived of basic human rights and considered expendable, the principle of the common good immediately becomes, logically and inevitably, a summons to solidarity and a preferential option for the poorest of our brothers and sisters. This option demands before all else an um, an appreciation of the immense dignity of the poor in the light of our deepest convictions and believers. And speaking at a Catholic institution, and for this moment, we always talk about the fact that we're a Dominican institution, but I'm going to say for this moment, for an hour, I want us to think about being a Catholic institution and the social charism of the Catholic Church. And um, so that's how I'm orienting um, today's talk. And one of the things that I wanted to start with was the fact that from the very first mark made by man, by woman, the end was the common good of that group. And this is a work from 27,000 years ago, 27,000 years ago, from Chauvet Cave in, um, in France. And if any of you have ever been to Hocking Hills, have, has anyone ever been to Old Man's Cave? And there's a big, like, cave in the front um, where people would have a fire because the smoke could get out. They would eat, they would sleep towards the back. But back in the recesses, where um, someone would have a very difficult time kind of crawling through these recesses, which would be completely dark. So a person would have to carry um, elements to illuminate the way and illuminate an opening in one of those fissures where this would, would have been made on the wall. Pigments would have had to have been ground, animal fat distilled and poured into little stone um, depressions with vegetable uh, fiber wicks. And someone was spending the time doing that instead of hunting or gathering. And really one of the most important things that a group 
in the Paleolithic period could do was get protein. Because if you didn't get enough protein, you didn't survive the winter, and you didn't have enough body fat to um, uh, be able to conceive, and your group would shrink down to nothing. But what, th what this shows us is that this work, this first, one of the first artworks we know from the world, must have been incredibly important because that person was taken out of these other kind of pools of occupations to do this. And we'll never know for sure what is going on in this. I, I want to move, as people in class know me, but I'm worried about this. Can I try to move and you tell me if it's okay? If you can still hear me? I can't. I can't. You can't? Oh, damn it. Okay. Okay, sorry. I will trip. No, no. No. I fall out of my car getting my seatbelt out. Um, so we know that this is an incredibly important endeavor. Um, and scholars hypothesize that this first artist was kind of um, uh, someone like a shaman. We would think of a shaman today. Can everybody call that to mind from Native American culture or some, some um, other um, cultures? And so we're going to say a shaman who for 100 years was always assumed to be a male. This summer, a skeleton was found in one of these caves that makes us believe that perhaps some shaman were female. So super excited super exciting for the field of prehistoric archaeology. More later, lots of scientific analysis has to come. But I do think that will mean something big. But what does mean something is the fact that this shaman, male or female, went through a lot of work to get to the back of this cave system and create incredibly naturalistic images. I think if you look at these spotted horses, they're incredibly naturalistic. And I'm not showing you the, the bulls from Lascaux or the rhinoceri from um, Altamira or anything like that. I will tell you that these images are incredibly naturalistic. And these images are created with natural pigments are around, that are around and we always see, let me see if I can get my cursor to work. Can you see that there is some abrasion on the surface and the lower part of this? I don't know if you can see it because this is a little dispelled. Well, we see this on every cave system that has been found. And we also have in those cave systems stone arrow points. And we are pretty, 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 pretty darn sure that the shaman acted upon those animals with weaponry to cause that to happen in real life. So that if that shaman acted upon those very naturalistic images, then the hunters from his or her group would have success in the hunt. And ultimately, this group would survive. Does that make sense? That's called sympathetic magic, OK? And it's something. Uh, written about quite commonly in um, anthropology and, and uh, archaeology. And the other thing we see in this work, which is uh, why I chose this one, is the hands of the shaman above the animal. And one thing I will tell you, because my college roommate, my graduate school roommate, is an ancient archaeologist. And these are about the same size as my hands, as a five foot two person. Okay? But you'll see they're over the animal, which should let you know power over the animal, right? Um, and my students often compare this to voodoo, all right? Think about the little voodoo doll. Um, once I made a voodoo doll of a boss that I had in another job. Ha, 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 wasn't it fun? Um, I didn't do anything bad, just give him foot pain, right? But you know, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of a joke. But it's this idea that you act upon a physical likeness of something that has that essence of something, and that action happens in the real world, right? Sympathetic magic. 
So I want to repeat just for a moment that the reason I'm starting my talk with this, because um, it's certainly not contemporary, but it shows, I think, pretty inequivocably that from its earliest appearance, art has been for the common good. Beauty came later, okay? This ensured the continuation of this group that lived in a cave and followed the hunt, okay? It's very calming to have Ron nod yes, uh, Dr. Karstens nod yes, Dr. Karstens hired me here, and he's, I really appreciate that he's here. Um, I want to go down closer to our time to kind of set the stage of what we're going to be looking at in terms of art for the common good. How many of you with a show of hands have heard of the artist Pablo Picasso in some, almost everyone. He's kind of a pop culture figure. You can go to Target over the holidays and get a mug of something with Picasso. Right, this is a work of his called Guernica from 1937. Guernica uh, is the name of a Basque town in northern France. Um, uh, you know, a, 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 that got caught in something really horrible in the Spanish Civil War. And Picasso had been asked to create some sort of work for the Spanish Pavilion for the Wor International World's Fair that was going to be in Paris in 1937. And he was paid a chunk of money, and he was given two years to create something, and he dragged his feet. As good procrastinators, I'm not looking at anybody over here, but a good, as a good procrastinator, he made you know a couple of print sets, he did a couple of things here and there, and he's like, what am I gonna do? So, and he got his inspiration, and it's really, it was a horrible inspiration, in that Franco made a deal with the head of the German Air Force. So this is in, in 1937. So the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, that you may know about from World War II and the Blitz and all of the devastation. Well, Franco, who denied this almost until his dying day, but we found, we found many records about this, he called up the head of the Air Force and said, I know you've been wanting to test some of your new planes and your new strategies. I have a perfect place for you to test. And this is not apocrypha. There had been a um, particular kind of civil resistance in Guernica to the nationalist government. Uh, nothing too horrible, certainly, by um, by contemporary standards, but they needed to be taught a lesson. And so uh, Franco arranged with the Luftwaffe to use their bombing and um, I think it's called strife, uh, strifing technology, where bullets hit the ground, is that right? Um, on market day in downtown Guernica. So at a moment, when all of the grannies and moms had their children downtown, and that was the target. And the images that went around the world were, um, you know, black and white photographs. And Franco denied that this happened and, um, and said it was the uh, Republican uh, rebels and so many of them were killed, it, it wasn't true at all. Um, and he found his inspiration for his work for, for the International Exhibition because tens of thousands of people would come through this exhibition, the, uh, the World Fair. Think about the um, OSU Fair. Has anyone ever gone to the State Fair in before times, as we call it? You know, tens of thousands of people go to that. Well, um, just under 200,000 people went to this international exhibition. And this work 
caused people to get inflamed. This is not the first time that this has happened, but um, it made a world sit up and take notice to a certain extent that something was happening in Germany, okay? In 1937 and 1938. And Picasso had his subject matter. And this is an oil painting on a canvas that then is mounted on a board. Um, as I showed you, uh, it's in the uh, Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid right now, but I wanted to show you just how much wall space it takes up. It was made to be shown in front of a lot of people. It was made to be shown so that people would walk up to it, and the figures, even though abstract, are just about their size. And um, if you see how um, thick this is, it was made to be lifted off that wall and travel. And after the, international, after the World Fair, it did travel around Europe, raising money for the, against Franco, essentially, against the nationalist government. And Picasso essentially said he would never step foot in Spain as long as Franco is president, and of course he was their native son, right? He transformed the art world, and he declared you know, a fatwa on, on Franco. And what we see in this image, oh, excuse me. What we see in this image are images pulled from Spanish folklore, from the history of Western art, um, from allegorical painting, and he's creating a new abstract language. So if we look at this, oh, do you see the cursor when I'm, oh, that's why Dan had a fishing pole, isn't it? The mother with the child at her breast, wailing. When you stand in front of that, I promise you, you tear up if you're a mom even if this is highly abstracted, right? And the person on the ground, the soldier who's trying to save people, but his, his, um, his sword is broken. That's a reference to Greek mythology. It's a reference to some of the images from the Acropolis. Um, the woman in flames um, in the building trapped in the building on the far right is something we will see later. A woman who's carrying a child and dragging her wounded leg. And perhaps at, at the very center of this composition is a symbol of world suffering through the horse. The horse who has no idea what's going on. He's there to have someone ride him into battle, or he's there to pull a plow, or he's there to, for the purest reasons, he represents all of nature that's being defiled by this act. And at the top, we have the light bulb that is also the explosion that comes from the sky. And in the corner, Scholars are, have been fighting for a long, long time about exactly what this is. Because it is either a portrait of Picasso himself. He often showed himself as a bull because it was very lusty, if you get what I mean, as was Picasso. But it was also a reference to Spanish culture and Spanish folklore. Picasso, this was a turning point in Picasso's long and storied career, one in which he avoided any politics, any social statement in any way. He felt people, the world had been violated to such an extent that he had to really change what he did after this. And he used this work, again, to raise money to take down the nationalist government in Spain and certainly sully the reputation of Franco, who he may have did a series of prints about in which he depicted Franco in cartoon form 
as a grotesque polyp and um, sent this all over the world. But uh, Picasso's very abstract work showed a reality that some newspapers did not want to show. I looked at some of the newspaper headings from New York Times, from um, uh, the London Times, uh, Le Figaro in Paris, and they show, um, a few images show airplanes over the city, they show the city um, burning, they show people running. They don't show the human costs of the Luftwaffe's r little exercise. And in my mind, this is um, someone whose legacy of making art for the common good is still really important in 2021, okay? So, interestingly, we're, we seem very cloistered in the US, don't we? We seem isolated from a lot of the things that are happening in the world, even though we have social unrest in our own country. But I wanted to introduce you to something, a, a group of artists doing something so revolutionary at the moment. And this is um, a group that uh, christened themselves 27N. And this is a Cuban uh, artist activist group that is very, very, very active. And this is an image of one of the ways they kind of started. This is 300 artists, Cuban artists, gathered outside of the Ministry of Culture in Havana on November 27th, hence 27N, to call for an end to human rights abuses by the government in Cuba. Now, one of the things that I will tell you is six years ago, six years ago, I went to study the work of the art of Cuban printmakers in Havana and some of the areas outside. And I just could not believe the facilities that they had provided by the government. And I was able to talk to artists, um, one of whom is a uh, member of 27N now, unbeknownst to me, only found uh, through uh, research. but. Um, so they have this really wonderful, their education is paid for, their master's degree is paid for. They have huge public studios that they work in. And artists also um, live in groups in lovely new developments in Havana that also um, act as their galleries. And they can sell to the population, but they can also sell to um, people coming from New York, for example, they open up their gallery to, to, um, to that. So for many artists, life was pretty good in Cuba, right? Better than the tour director, better than the bus driver, better than something like this. So they're risking a lot speaking out against that system. And they published a manifesto this past spring and this is just, I felt, a, a very important part of the manifesto that will tie into this talk very nicely. We aspire to work for a society with social justice and well-being, where each Cuban, not each artist, they're not talking about themselves, they're talking about each Cuban can live in his country uh, from the fruits of his work where the productive forces are freed and bureaucratic parasitism is replaced by a capable and proactive civil service. That we may leave behind the misery and shortages imposed by the incompetence of the prevailing system and that the rights to a decent life be granted. The rights to a decent life. That's the common good. Just let us live. Let us not go to bed hungry. Um, that we may leave behind the misery and shortages imposed by the incompetence of the prevailing system and that the rights to a decent life be guaranteed with assurances, among other things, to health 
and public education. It's not too much to ask, is it? But because they published this, and it got to the United States and it was published, and it got to um, Europe and was published, many of these artists were arrested, many were beaten. I don't want to use the word tortured because I have not, I haven't read absolute evidence about the use of that term. Um, but all of this came about because the things that had been so good for the Cuban population, such as healthcare, one of the premier healthcare systems in the world, right? Very fine education. The government was even skimping on those things, right? And so people could not live a decent life. So artists decided to speak out. And the government responded to the fact that all artists now had to register with the government. They had to be granted a permit to make art, okay? And this is when we started seeing um, even more wide-scale protests. And I wanted to share with you one of these artists um, named Tanya, uh, excuse me, Tanya Bouguera. Um, and this is a project that she's doing in the United States. And she's been working for 20 or so years. She, she is someone um, who has been very active in the Havana art scene. She's also an internationally recognized artist, um, as are many Cuban artists. This is something, um, this is a social process art. And social process art, which is kind of what we do at Ohio Dominican, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But social process art is one where you are doing rather than just making, okay? Totally socially engaged, and there was always a sense that the common good is the end goal, all right? Now, Bruguera has, um, at this time, she's had exhibitions at the most important galleries in the world. She is... Um, you know, she's making a decent living. She's very respected. And so as part of this project, she works with the Queen's Museum to sponsor this. And they lease some property in Queens. And this is the site of the Immigrant Movement International, which lasted from 2010 to 2015. Um, as part of this movement, Bruguera gave away her IDs, her American driver's license, her insurance card, her credit cards, her bank account, everything, and moved into an apartment building filled with um, refugees and lived for a year in conditions that she said were really, you know, intolerable, except you had to tolerate them because this was all you could have as, as someone in this underground citizenry. Does that make sense? And as part of that, she also arranged for this shop front and building to be a place, almost like an immigrant resource center, where um, once a week there's a health clinic in the front of the, the shop so that people can you know, get their flu shot, get penicillin, whatever they need to get. Um, but also, they would have um, little workshops, like on maintaining your used bike. They would get lots of used bikes and teach people how to maintain the bike so that they had a way to move around if they didn't have money for the subway or felt that at some point they'd have to show their ID for the subway. So she learned about negotiating a place in society as a completely invisible citizen. And that now is forming a big chunk of her work. One other thing, I didn't show an image of this um, that is really quite wonderful, is the fact that um, a children's music school came out of this. Um, a group of um, Cuban artists got um, strings instruments for this, um, for this little shop front. 
and they um, taught the children, they are teaching the children um, of these immigrants uh, strings techniques. And they go around giving concerts, raising awareness to the fact that those kids are really no different than our kids, except they're forced to live in an underground economy. All right? Did this intrigue you when you saw, right? This is an artist known as J.R. He travels around the world in, in um, taking images in what he calls his inside out project. Think about the Google Earth mobile. He drives around in this little vehicle and it has like a, it looks like it has a fake camera on the outside, but it actually does have image taking equipment. And he goes around to areas where um, people need help. Uh, there's economic unrest, political unrest, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He takes large format photographs that he then uses the techniques of advertising and creates these huge site-specific installations. So we see, um, I believe this little girl's name was called Kakita, and she's an actual uh, child that uh, JR saw in this area. We are standing in California, and the other side is the Mexican uh, city of Tecate, right? And Kakita is looking over into California, isn't she? She's like, oh, mm. and look at how big her hand is. That really cracks me up. You know, little kids like put their hand on a cat's face, and they're like, um, this is a wonderful image because it's before he took formal images and put them on social media. Someone else took this image. So it made its way around the world in a couple of days before he published it. This is what it looks like on the other side. And it took over 100 people to create this framework, and they had to dig down into the ground as, as um, as deep as this is tall, so that it was, um, you know, a very carefully engineered structure. And the whole idea, of course, is why? Why does that line, you know, have to keep that baby out? So meant to just kind of hit you over the head with provocation. So I'm going to go backwards in time. So this one is fairly recent. Uh, but I want to show you this one, and I will tell you that in 2008, in the winter, this actual photograph was on the cover of the dispatch in Columbus. And I cut it out of my, um, my uh, newspaper and sent it around my art history class. And we didn't know anything about it at that time. We didn't know who the artist was. And we now know that this is JR again, and this was just one of a global series called Women Are Heroes. And these took place in, um, this is from the favelas of Brazil. He took them in the town squares in Liberia after men were executed in front of their families. He took, uh, he took these in, um, India, in some of the worst uh, slums, whenever there's pain and suffering of women, he goes and does a project like this. So this is ongoing. So if you don't know about the favelas, of course, in the, in the 80s and 90s, and even in the, the aughts a little bit, um, Brazil made a lot of money from the petrochemical industry and from the mineral industry. They were pretty rich, right? And they also had a certain sort of cattle that no one else did. So like a steak would cost you $1,000 of this type. They were, made a lot of money. And at the same time, they had an alternative city outside of the city called the favela, which were essentially like shanty towns. And in 2007, there were a series of brutal rapes and murders of women in the favelas and the authorities kind of went, mm, meh, they live in the favelas, what do they expect? And 
more violence came to light against women. And so JR, Superman JR, took his photography series, took his little inside out truck, and interviewed some of the victims of the violence and gave them agency through their voices and he covered the favela with their eyes. And I love this one particularly because people are um, hanging up their laundry in front of it. And these would not be taken down at a certain time. They were put up in the same way that like um, Guerrilla artists do, you know, guerrilla artists use um, aerosol cans, which is so five minutes ago. You're supposed to print out like environmentally stable paper and use rice paste. So you put it on the side of buildings and it decomposes with the buildings. So it is very stable environmentally. So this eventually kind of um, fell apart, but not after um, the world of popular culture and the art world fell in love with these. This was a woman who was killed in, um, in a hor horrifying act of violence in the favelas. All right? Again, J.R. could be making a lot of money in New York City in galleries. He could be making a lot of money selling editions of these works because he is a darling in the art world. But he prefers actually not even to kind of let people really know about him. We know he's Parisian. We think his parents are from Algeria. But he is, his work is about bringing wrongs to the top of our, uh, bringing attention to social wrongs, the common good. So that's a little bit of an introduction, that's like the first half. But I want to talk to you very quickly about how this started, how um, Sister Diane and I um, started talking about the common good, and that was because Christy Flood Weiner asked me to do a talk about some aspect of, of art during the pandemic. And so I was like, I want to do the history of art in pandemics. And so I looked at things like the smallpox, um, the smallpox epidemic in 8th century Japan and the prints that people bought to ward off the smallpox demons. And we came all the way down, and I think I ended, Christy, with a lot of the um, guerrilla art, um, the taggers, the graffiti artists from around the world. And this is one of those pieces. This is from someone called, his tag name is Lush Sucks. And it's an image of Xi Jinping, of course, the Chinese uh, premier. And this was not in China, this was in Melbourne, because if it were in China, Lush Sucks would have been hunted down and killed, right? Um, and the translation is nothing to see, carry on. Notice he's in a nice little space suit, not getting the virus but he let his country flounder for many months, right? And the virus got out of the country. So this is, um, this is very critical of him. This is from someone in Hijack, uh, named Hijack in Los Angeles, um, uh, downtown LA, and uh, this is someone who issued a public statement and said, you know, if we're going to fight this pandemic, we need to go to war. And so he started doing images like this, essentially like tagging images all around town. So instead of weapons, they have Purell, which I find very funny, and lots of toilet paper. Here's another one that in its utter simplicity I thought was really wonderful. Um, this is from a group in Miami, and we don't know the names of the artists. This is called the Kapu Collective. And so this is in, um, you know, kind of a refuse area by a quarry, and someone has just created um, an image that looks like a wrecking ball that has caused all of this damage. But instead of the wrecking ball, it's the coronavirus vaccine. Not the vaccine, excuse me. The um, actual microbe that causes um, the pandemic. 
We, have, we see images around the world. This is something that a group of artists did outside of a, uh, um, a Malaysian clinic and um, where they still do not have the vaccines. They're still able to give tests, but they don't have vaccines. And this is kind of, um, you know, showing a bit of pride at the medical establishment. This is an, uh, another from Senegal. This is um, a street artist called Zibaru. And Zibaru decided that he was going to inspire women to make and wear beautiful masks to keep, the, um, to keep the virus at bay. And again, Senegal, you know, Africa has such a low population of uh, vaccine that um, they're very, they're, they're back in the spring where we were, actually. And here's another, um, this is from Nairobi. And this is um, an artist who goes by the name Grandson. And I love the kids running past this, but I also love that we have a female nurse, girl power, chasing the pandemic devil, the, um, the coronavirus, trying to catch him before he goes around the world. So all of these images kind of meant to inspire people to do what they can to stop the spread. And you've seen these images. Super nurse from Amsterdam, right? You can get t-shirts with this now. It's on the cover of books. You may have seen this image, Eduardo Coba, um, another Brazilian. This work is called Unity, and UNESCO's thinking that this will be their Christmas card this year. Children from every different religion, every different country, all masked up, fighting for the same thing. And then I had to show you a little humor. This is another of those artists who is a superstar in the world. He's a multimillionaire who began as a skateboarder street artist, who became so popular, wealthy people started chiseling his works out of walls and taking them home. And now they sell at auction for millions of dollars. And this, uh, the artist is named Banksy. And in June 2020, it's kind of a year before um, a lot of the things we had just seen, he filmed himself um, filling uh, London subway with these little rats um, that were sprayed on, and they were sneezing all over the place. And so these are all of the germs, and then here we have some rats that are cleaning up the, oh, that's the next slide. Other rats that are coming to um, clean up the damage with their Purell. And the idea is, come on, keep your face covered, wash your hands, make sure you sneeze into your mask. So like a public health message for those um, uh, four riders of the subway. And then he did this. I'm going to show you this other photo first. His son got ill, three years old. It was suspected that it was COVID. He lives near Southampton. And he was in Southampton Hospital. And when he was in Southampton Hospital, he saw how stretched to the limit the health, um, the health workers in the hospital were. So he arranged with someone to create a print, and he put it in the foyer um, of the main nurse's station. Here you have a nurse taking a photo. And, and it's called Game Changer. And here we have a little kid who's thrown away his superheroes, Batman and Superman, and instead he's got an old-fashioned nurse superhero. He made prints from this and sold the painting to benefit the, um, that wing of the hospital and the healthcare workers, and his work raised $16.8 million. Okay? So not for himself, 
but for the common good, to bring in teams of traveling nurses um, to give people uh, uh, time off. And another superstar artist, Ai Weiwei. And you may have heard of him or seen him in some pop, pop culture outlet. Ai Weiwei, a Chinese dissident artist, created the Mask Project for Refugee International. Because, of course, the refugee settlements were incredibly hard hit by um, the pandemic. And so he took images so um, uh, that he made work about, uh, about um, imprisonment, about surveillance, about social media. And he printed the blue face masks that a lot of you are wearing with his specific images. He packaged them together and he put them on eBay. So you and I could get them on eBay. And he raised, to this point, he's raised $1.8 million for Refugee International. And I know I'm getting um, short on time. This talk talked about sunflowers and sugar. And I was going to talk about a work that Ai Weiwei did about um, the industrial area hit by um, sanctions by the Chinese government, which left lots of people impoverished. But I felt I wanted to, to show you this work as well. And again, this is an artist who's internationally acclaimed. He could emigrate to another country, but he goes back to China even though he gets rest arrested every other day, practically, is put under house arrest, is kept at kind of a low living wage. And this is a work, this is uh, one of the works that solidified his reputation around the world. It's called Remembering. And this is the install an installation he did. Um, the building behind this is the Munich Art Museum. And this installation is called Remembering, or She Lived Happily for Seven Years in This World. That's what the Chinese characters spell out. Here's a closer view so you can see what this facade of the building is made of. And I'll give you one more and you'll finally see what this is made of. They're made of children's backpacks. Because in 2007, you may remember, some of the students in my class, classes remembered this, even though they were little ones. In 2007, the Sichuan province in Japan had an 8.8 .8, uh, on the Richter scale earthquake. Do you remember that? And there were scenes just showing whole landscapes flattened. I don't know if you remember that. And among the buildings that were flattened were several schools. Here's one that actually fared well. But 9,000 children were unaccounted for. And these are families that got buses and went to the sites to see if their children lived and the Chinese um, government would not let them get near and sent them home. And so the only reason that families found out their children died were if they didn't come home until Ai Weiwei came in with a team of hackers and, you know, hackers for good, thank goodness for them, and brought all of his attention as a social dissident, Chinese social dissident, and went in and found lists of all of the children who were in the schools and published those. His team created piles of types of stuff in hopes that eventually the family would be able to come back and get this. 
Family left photos hoping if anyone saw anything, they would um, uh, let authorities know. And these were the lists of the children that were gotten from hacking. So to this day, in 2021, we do not have a complete list of the people killed in these earthquakes. And one of the things, um, and especially in the schools, and one of the things that's so specific about this is the fact that um, forensic study has shown that the cement provided by the government was, was cut with so many things to stretch it that none of those schools would have been able to stand up in the earthquake. So the Chinese government was directly responsible for this. So you know why Ai Weiwei is arrested, right? Um, I'm going to skip one thing because I want to show you ODU. And if people want to talk about this one afterwards, I'm very happy to stay after. But what I wanted to say is at ODU, our art department revolves around the idea of the common good. Beauty is important as well, but we are always asking, who's this for? What's this message? And that doesn't stop when students graduate from Ohio Dominican. So this is a series of alums Gay Riesland, who I thought might be able to come today, she works for the Martin de Porres Center, was one of the main organizing artists behind the Black Lives Matter mural downtown. And this is her with her two murals. And I like to say that she took my historic um, painting techniques class and learned about Gothic manuscripts. And you see a little bit of that uh, tracery around here. And um, Amy Marino Haggard, uh, someone who played softball here and was really kind of an all-American um, girl and has become someone whose graphics are traveling around the world at the request of other countries because of these graphics that make a point that are very, very uplifting. And actually right now she's doing a series of these um, Black Lives Matter uh, on the roads in East Linden. So you can go take a look, uh, take a look at them now. And this is Richard Duarte Brown, um, a young, uh, he's not a young man, he's older than I am. Uh, he came to university at the age of 45. He was born in prison, knew that art was his voice, and every work that he makes is about uplifting the community, every aspect of the community. He did many of the um, Black Lives murals downtown, and Easton Town Center asked him to do a series of things for them, so you see uh, that's what these are. And at ODU, when it's time to vote, we get, out the, we get out the vote, and we, any downtime, we make little vote pins. Notice there are no colors that uh, indicate any political preference. They just say vote. And we did hundreds and hundreds of these, and we sold them for or five dollars and made a lot for a food pantry, and for Panther, the Panther Pantry, and we were in the newspaper for this also. And the last work that I want to show you is something that came to me this morning that I thought was the perfect ending for this talk. And this came from Jeanette Thomas, uh, one of our alums who teaches at East Linden Elementary. She's the art specialist. She left Dublin City Schools because she didn't have anything to teach those children. She couldn't, do, she couldn't help them. And she is a beloved teacher in East Linden. I think she was a teacher of the year. I've had a couple of teachers of the year. But she sent these to me. Um, these were um, self-portraits for the new year. And 
I thought, if these don't inspire you, that our work with children and students and faculty, because we're a horrible, recalcitrant bunch, um, nothing will. So that there's so much joy in gearing work to the common good. I have another really heavy piece that I can talk about after if you would like to. It's a work by Kara Walker, but I also know that time is of the essence, and if you want to ask any questions about what I already showed you, I'm happy to do that.